Good morning. It's good to see you all. If you don't know me, my name's Oliver and I'm usually over at the Hurstbridge campus, but have the uh, great blessing to be here today over at Eltham and Tom is uh, over at Hurstbridge today. Um, yeah, thanks again, Joe. I was uh, yeah, saying I was just really touched by that imagery of just dragging up this big catch. I'm like, oh, how do we put in a dragnet here? What is that going to look like? Uh, so may the Lord sow the seed to see that dragnet. Because, yeah, as you were saying, Emmanuel, there are just many broken, needy people, um, yeah, who are, yeah, in great need, as we ourselves are. <laughs> Perhaps we acknowledge it more quickly than others. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to uh, look at, uh, yeah, this morning. Heavenly Father, how we need to wait. How quickly I rush. I rush to pray. I rush to speak, to act. I rush when there's pain so that it's soothed. I rush uh, when I see difficulty. Uh, I rush out the door. Lord, there seems to be an increase of rushing in this world in our hearts, and uh, as we read in the scripture, Lord, we see there's an importance of waiting. And so, Lord, I, I ask that you would teach us to wait, to wait upon what you are wanting, to wait before we speak, to wait before we pray, before we act, to wait when we seek your understanding of what a dragnet could look like in this region of Eltham to catch that we might be fishers of men and Lord I do pray that you would minister your truth to us today by your power Lord may you um, move may I abide in your spirit there is no greater place to be. Rather than rushing to do what seems good to me, to wait on what your Holy Spirit is leading. And in that place, Lord, there is great blessing and richness. And may we wait to hear what you want to speak. And we just thank you for how you've already ministered so deeply and so much throughout this service. We want to uplift our children as well, who are out in various rooms and those who are leading them. Um, give them diligence fondness, tenderness, um, firmness as well, as they teach and instruct these dear children. May they grow in the fear and instruction of the Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to be looking today at, uh, I've titled this, Drawing Near to the Father. And uh, yesterday, there's a group of us who ended up down in Doveton at a mosque, and uh, we, uh, Paris rocked up, that was great, out of the blue, I wasn't expecting him, I was sitting down, I was like, oh, Paris! <laughs> and so we had a bit of time with uh, a man named Bernie Power, who uh, teaches at MST, and, um, and he gave us a bit of teaching around Islam, very kind of confronting and then down to earth and connecting, and, and then we went out and, uh, to a mosque and sat, um, watched some prayers, uh, these Muslim people watching in prayers and had a bit of Q&A afterwards with the Imam, it was very... Uh, great time, very fascinating. And one of the things that came out for me was um, it, it helps you to be more thankful for what you have in Jesus Christ when you can contrast it with something else. You're like, wow, this is wonderful. <laughs> Not to have to do all these things, make sure I wash in a particular fashion before I pray or um, that, you know, God may forgive, He may not forgive. It might depend on what he's feeling or what he's wanting to do. He might be merciful, he might not be. Uh, just knowing who God is and the reliance of that, I was like, wow, there's so many simple things I just take for granted in my own faith. So it was a wonderful time. And uh, yeah, I, I had it on my heart to really press in deeply. So throughout this prayer week um, and the last few um, 
um, sessions in the preaching, we've been looking particularly at the topic of prayer. And so what I did uh, last Sunday at Hurstbridge, I got up on the screen and I just put all these different words, and I haven't brought that along today, but there were just different words, and I said, pick two that describe your prayer life, and there were things like monotonous, invigorating, boring, <laughs> weary, frustrating, um, guilt-ridden, a whole range of words, and you had to sort of pick two, and, and, and what's your experience like? And then we just, I just went to the scripture and just said, you know, so often when we're in these negative sort of places of feeling like guilt-ridden or bored or like man, fed up with prayer, whatever it might be, we don't, we just stay stuck there. We don't sort of work through that. And so I just went <laughs> to different places. I'll, I'll show one uh, just from Habakkuk. And, uh, you know, I think we've all experienced, um, if we're honest, um, yeah, degrees of frustration or disappointment. And uh, so often I think we just get stuck there. But Habakkuk, you know, he was in this place of disappointment and discouragement. He prays like this. This is the second verse of Habakkuk. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? <laughs> Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? You don't have to hear those prayers being prayed from the front, do you? <laughs> God breathed that out, brothers and sisters. He said, this is my living word. When a saint of his cried out and prayed like that. Wow. And I was reflecting, I was like, I want to take this deeper. Because, you know, we have these experiences of prayer and Lord willing as you've been praying throughout this week and you engage in prayer not only in this week but throughout your life and it's a, such a significant part of our faith, our relationship with the Lord. When we pray, what stops us praying like that? Or what prevents us? Maybe there's a small insignificant thing or what, what, why, why do we not turn to the Lord? And I was reflecting on this. So I wanted to press into, the, into our relationship with the Father so I've called this Drawing Near to the Father. And um, yeah, I'll just be scattering a few passages of Scripture through these reflections. But I wanted to consider, first of all, how we entered into a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And uh, it's a word that's in the Bible, but we don't often use a lot. Um, and it's this word, adoption. You have been adopted. And when you've been adopted, that means many things at once. It means that you were not originally a part of that family, and originally you were part of another sort of family. It had a different sort of set of beliefs, values, and behaviors. But someone, the father of that family, said, I want you. I want you to come. And you responded, you engaged, and you said, Yes, I'll be a part of this family. And you adopted in. And you imagine like a family who've got their own sort of way of doing meal time, their own way of um, having rest or holiday time together, and you're adopted into that family. You've got to figure out how that family does it. You're like, well, it wasn't like this in my family or what my experience is. You have been adopted. And so there's a need to learn and to change and to grow into the family that you've been adopted into and what you've been coming out of. And I think we can underestimate the significance of that. Because in that, you know, adoption is like a, a one-off event, but there's a process of understanding what that means, right? And you can miss something that happened in the early stages of your adoption experience that can just continue on and you continue getting stuck on that same thing over and over again. It's like just uh, you're banging your head against something. It's like, man, it's just getting annoying now. <laughs> My hand's starting to hurt. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> it's just over and over. And this here, there's just been moved over and you just thought, yeah, of course, you know, I'm a part of this church, the experience, you know, or I might have even grown up in the church from a young age or I don't know. But there are things in our experience that we need to come near to our Father in heaven and say, what do you speak? What do you say? Let me just read something very briefly that just gives you an, a bit of a, a feel for this. And it, it's, um, this is from Romans 8. And Paul is writing here about adoption. And uh, he says this. I'll read a few verses here from uh, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. 
the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. There's a lot there. I'm not going to unpack it all, but you can see that God has adopted us. And as we slow, as we wait and we listen, can we hear the voice of adoption of the Spirit of God crying within us? You are a son, a daughter of someone you cannot see, you cannot touch, you cannot feel. But there is the spirit of adoption coming from the Holy Spirit that cries out from within. And it's interesting. There is, with that, an inheritance. We become heirs, provided, interesting, provided we suffer with him. This is one of the values of the family. This is one of the things that we believe. It's not a value of suffering, so to speak. But there is something in suffering that is a part of our family that unites you and me as a brother and sister. And when we talk about these things and we understand them, there can be experiences that you've had and that I've had that we connect and relate on and we can see the hand of our Heavenly Father working in our lives and doing a wonderful thing. And so suffering is something that's maybe foreign from the family you've come from, yet it is an absolute necessity in the family of God to suffer with, to be a part of, to join in the difficulty and the trial. And so we enter in, and we're in this family, and uh, like in any relationship, you know, Imagine you, you were actually adopted into a family and you had to get to know uh, this father. And you're like, well, I feel like I'm not really part of this family. That, no, no, the dad's sitting you down. No, I want to reassure you, I definitely adopted you. You were part of this family. I'm going to treat you like any other mother, sons or daughters. And uh, it's like, okay, I've got to stomach that. I've got to process that. But I don't feel it. You know, it's, it's a journey, right? And um, so in this relationship with your father in heaven, There are things that you have in your relationship with him that are common to every other relationship, dynamics that are very common and similar, and things that are entirely unique. And that's important to realize. You have to treat it just like any other relationship, and then you have to treat it at points unlike any other relationship, and knowing the difference between them. And one of the things that is so unique about our Father in Heaven, among our relationships with many people we have, is that you cannot see him, you cannot touch him, you cannot get a hug from him, you cannot listen to him. Some people in their um, journey of faith have experienced the audible voice of God. I've never had that experience. Um, I may one day, I don't know. (laughs) But you're relating to someone you cannot see, you cannot touch. How do you go about that? How do you do that? Because so often, for example, my relationship with my other wife, I express so much in touch or hearing and, and how you're doing, all that sort of a thing. How do you listen to someone? You can't actually hear them speak to you audibly. There's a learning process there. Again, this is foreign. And so through that process of adoption, it's a learning. And that's where our Father knows us so deeply and intimately. It is amazing to be known that well that he knows exactly how you're feeling, all the ins and outs. And if you're ever feeling like, Lord, I just don't even know how to relate to you, that you can pray that out and you can speak that to him and ask for his help and guidance in that. That's amazing. (laughs) If I were to say that to my wife, I don't even know how to relate to you. <laughs> like, imagine how my wife's going to respond to that. <laughs> you know, your heavenly Father will respond to you perfectly every time. That is amazing. It's a wonderful thing. It says in Hebrews, uh, this chapter 11. Um, and chapter 11 unpacks many things of faith goes through different people and and, uh, defines faith. But in verse 6, it says this of Hebrews 11, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
For whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And that is one of the foundations of your relationship with your Father in heaven. It is your faith. If you don't believe that he exists or if you don't believe that when you're praying that he hears you, if you don't believe that he's going to be speaking to you, how, how is there going to be action or, or um, interaction in that relationship? You know, our relationships with one another can go through a similar thing. If I go through a difficult season in my relationship with my wife and I'm like, I don't believe she's even hearing me. How is that going to be impacting, right? So that belief that I'm now carrying in my marriage is impacting on my relationship with her. Those kinds of things impact also on our relationship with our Father in heaven. Do we believe that he hears, that he knows. And there's this transfer and meeting suddenly with, all right, this is where I'm at. And I'm realizing, yeah, I've got to make some movement here to transition and to say, God, do I really believe? Or I have, I've seen. But remind me again. You know, even this morning, I was saying to (laughs) Dwayne, okay, here's the honest moment. I think it was at breakfast this morning, I said, or maybe last night, I don't feel like preaching tomorrow. Do you know I go through places like that? And I woke up this morning, and there was that similar feeling, I was continuing to press in and unpack. You know what I did to work through that? I went and prayed. Went for a walk in the rain. <laughs> and it was great. I love the rain for that reason. There's not many people around when it rains. You can just really talk. And so I, I wanted to be praying for you. But I couldn't. I had to deal with myself, (laughs) bringing myself before my father. And I knew he knew everything that was going on in my heart and I couldn't even articulate exactly why I didn't feel so much like preaching today. I was like, Lord, I just want to be honest. And as I went and I was starting to pray, it was just like... (sighs) These breaths like that were coming out. (sighs) And there was no real like big issue in my life or thing that I was going through. It was just, you know, what was happening? But I went to prayer and I was like, I know there's someone who knows me better than my own wife, better than me, who I can just share what's going on. And I want to press in, Lord, into what you want so that I can do your will and I can preach with joy and delight. And as I was speaking out like that, there was someone out there who heard me and did something within me. I don't even know how that worked, but I was, shortly after I was walking down the road, I was thanking the Lord and I was just saying, I just thank you so much, Lord, for the ministry of your Holy Spirit to me. It is doing something right now. Thank you. And this is going to lead me into what I'd like to spend a bit of time here on, is just building trust in your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Such an important thing. Trust is such a crucial commodity, aspect, part of any relationship. And you do not realize and appreciate the trust that you have in a relationship until that trust is being tested or undermined. And when that trust is being eroded or removed and you've got to try and navigate the dynamics of the relationship or what you're needing in that situation, wow, that's when the pressure gets on. Do you trust your Father in heaven with your life? There are so many things that can impact on our trust. I'm just going to draw out a few. And one is other relationships that you've had with others. The relationship that you've had with your Father here on earth can impact your relationship with your Father in heaven. You might have had a Father who... Um, was really overbearing and really critical, micromanaged everything in your life, or a father who was the opposite, distant, and you would have loved for him to be micromanaged, saying something, but he was just so aloof, so in his own world, so consumed with what he wanted. Or a father who was really, um, yeah, just painful, caused you lots of grief and bitterness. I don't know your journey. Or a father who brought much delight to you and there was just much pleasure that you had in your relationship. 
You know what? It's amazing. <laughs> I'm uh, 35, and I, I've been talking to people who have been 60, 70, and older, and they talk about, as 60 and 70-year-olds, the impact that their parents had on them. I was over at Lake's entrance, and there was a man I asked, what, who has been the most influential person in your life? He was in his 70s, and he's first person that came out of his mouth, my mum. That's amazing. His mum is no longer going to be alive, but a 70-year-old man, so much life, and he said, his mother. Take that to heart, mothers. <laughs> that is a privilege. What a privilege. Every day in the uh, trenches of motherhood, keep at it. Keep at it in your fatherhood. But these things can impact, and, and we can, through our experience with our own fathers, it could be a pastor, a church leader, and you've had some sort of negative experience or positive, we can colour that, and, and, and it sort of like blends our relationship with our Father on earth, our relationship with our Father in heaven, it just mushes together a bit. We've got to separate those out and understand that there's a difference. Yes, there's similarities. He's revealed himself as Father, and there was a reason he chose to do that. They're very two different people. In your life, what are you afraid of being touched? If there was something that I could come and I could put my finger on right now, you'd be like, it would hurt. It would be vulnerable. It would be hard to open up. It may have been something deeply grievous that has happened to you that someone did many, many years ago and you have never even opened up to anyone what happened. It could have been something that you did to someone else and you remember seeing the look on their face and what you felt in your heart at that moment and you've carried that regret with you for years and years. Or it could be slight things that have um, built up here and there doesn't necessarily have to be one big thing. It can be the same thing over and over again. A small thing, but it can build up. What are you afraid of being touched in your life? Or what about something you don't want to have happen in the future? I hope my Father in Heaven would never call me to be a missionary in India. Wow, I don't know about that. I'll just, uh, la, 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 la. I'm listening, but I'm not listening, but I am listening, but I'm not. <laughs> what are you afraid of being touched? And do you trust that your Father in Heaven could come into that place and be with you and all of His perfection and glory manifest there and His will touching that area of your life, changing, molding, interacting, doing something? Do you trust that he could go at the pace that you could handle in that situation, in a way that he could move and keep in step with what you need, not um, letting you lag behind and just wallow in the same place, and not pushing you too hard, but he knows you so well, he can move you at exactly the right place in working through that. That he, if you brought that to him, and you opened up to the light, the things that are within that there would be layers underneath that you didn't even realize exist, and you're like, wow, that is why my behavior and my responses have been like this over and over again in these situations, and I never even realized. I've experienced my father interacting with me like that, drawing things out, and like, wow, I had no idea that was under there, and how glad I am that I came and I brought it and interacted with him. What else? Do you trust or not trust your Heavenly Father with? What about the things that are valuable to you? When there's something that's really precious and you extend it out, you're putting your heart out there, wow, you're putting a lot of trust in that person when you're trusting something valuable. If I said to you, I want you to look after my daughter, Hadassah, and my younger son, Raphael, they're very precious to me. <laughs> I'll be putting a lot of trust in you to do that. And I thank the Lord. I have so many people in my life I can do that with. Often I'm filling out... Uh, uh, referee things and, uh, you know, how would you say this person interacts with children? Would they, would you be comfortable with them looking after your own children? <laughs> I'm often writing to those things. They have looked after my own children. <laughs> what a privilege that I have people I can place that level of trust in. What is valuable to you? Your family. Do you trust your family to the Lord? 
in difficult times. And when everything's sailing and um, swimmingly going well, it's fine. But man, where the waves crush, uh, wash on the rock of the house and the testing times come, are we trusting the Lord with those things that are so valuable to us? What about your career? It's fine when it's going along, when you feel like, wow, you might be facing a redundancy or you might be, I don't know what, out of work. Or the things that you like to do, the things that you like to get. Can you trust God to come into those places, your pursuit of sport or shopping or your hobbies or passions? Can you trust God to come into those spaces and for Him to work and to adjust the way that you enjoy sport, the way that you spend your money shopping, the way that you um, interact with others? Could you trust that He could do a work in you in that space in a way that you never even thought was possible to give you a greater freedom and joy and delight in your life? Just this week, I was opening the Bible with a few people and I was working through a bit of a passage and at the end, I I just said uh, very simply, you know what, similar to this passage, there might come a day where God will want to call to you and you might want to respond. He might call and start to speak to you. And as I was closing up that time, one of the people there reacted, you know, reasonably significantly, like it was obvious to me and I was like, wow, there was something going on there when I just put out that last thing. So I, you know, just gave, you know, wrapped everything up, gave it a bit of space, and then I, I sort of went to this person and said, hey, why don't you just come over here and sit with me? So we sat down together, and I just sort of, in love, you know, just wanted to open up um, a bit more. And I said, oh, I just, you know, how are you feeling when um, I said, you know, God might one day want to call to you and speak to you? And this person said, no, no, I don't, don't want that. And I said, why not? Guess what came out of their mouth? They said this, I don't like God. I was at the same time surprised and at the same time, wow, that makes so much sense. Have you ever omitted a thought like that? I don't like God. You know this person, they go to church regularly. I've heard them pray. They're regularly in the Word. And yet they said in that honest moment to me, I don't like God. And there was trust in my relationship with them. So I could say to them, why not? Why don't you like God? And this answer is going to floor you. (laughs) They said, because of the soldiers. That was my five-year-old son, Justin. (laughs) And he had seen Jesus dying on the cross in these storybooks. (laughs) And he had seen the soldiers crucifying and he had put those two things so close together what the soldiers had done to Jesus and Jesus' death on the cross, that he was like, I don't like God because of the soldiers. He knew that was the heart, the heart of our faith. He comes regularly with me to church. He prays. I'm regularly in the Word with him. And he'd seen those things like, I don't want that. Even though he was praying. And as we sat down together, I opened up a children's Bible with him. I was just gently separated those two things out. I said, you see what the soldiers did here? That was because there were people who wanted to kill Jesus and get at him. But you see Jesus, through this situation, he did everything that was right and true and good and whole. You know what happens? We, he sat in my lap when we were talking. He went, a five-year-old released a breath like that. Parents, watch over your children diligently. Love them, build trust. Adults, watch over the children in this church diligently. Love them, build trust. Watch over one another. Love one another, build trust. Watch over your relationship with your Father in heaven. Love him, build trust. And things that you might not even realize that are going on in your heart will surface at points, maybe through a Bible study, maybe in an interaction. And you might have to be honest and say, you know what, I don't like God or whatever it needs to come out. And something surfaces in that moment that is within you, you didn't even realize. There was a need to just draw it out, to bring it to the light, and to get that clarity of, oh, 
I had just lumped all those things in together. There was something there that needed to be separated and I just didn't have the detail or the skill. And that's where we minister to one another as a body. It's a beautiful thing. I need you in that. <laughs> there are times when I, you know, my wife, the same thing. You know, I was like, I don't feel like preaching tomorrow. I'm like, I'm sharing where I'm at. Can you release me to go for a walk? We need to have that conversation, you know? We've got four little kids. There's a lot going on. So my wife served me by looking after four kids and all the mayhem that that is in the morning (laughs) so that I could go for a walk in the rain. We need to experience who God is, how we need to experience who God is. Because there are claims that God has put forth through his Bible of his character that we understand, claims of his faithfulness, his justice, his... um, kindness and tenderheartedness, his wrathfulness, his care, his love, and all of these things that God has explained to us through the Bible, we may know to varying degrees. And there's one character that binds them all together. It's like um, if you picture a crown, it's all these beautiful jewels in the crown, and you know, perhaps love is one of the, um, you know, the key gems in that crown, but actually the beauty of it is in the arrangement. And that's his holiness. That's every part is arranged exactly as it needs to be. That means that his justice will stop exactly where it needs to stop and his love will move forward or his grace at that point. Or his kindness will continue on and continue on in his patience. You see him in how he dealt with Israel, for example. He was patient with them many years and then he said, this is the time, I will wipe you out from my presence. Because it was right. If he had waited longer, that would have been wrong. But in his perfect holiness, every gem of his character is arranged in exactly the right way that he knows exactly when to stop one thing and move into another to transition. That's amazing. You know what? When Jesus came on earth, he simply manifested that life out. And you were adopted into that family. (laughs) You have that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And he is arranging, if you let him, those parts of your life that the crown of your life reflects the glory of your Father in heaven. Wonderfully. So we can understand these things in theory. You know, you can listen to sermons online, you can um, read the Bible, you can study it, you can hear the testimony of others, and you can absorb the character of God. But at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, it is up to you. The push comes to shove. Push, come, push comes to shove. The rubber hits the road when you start to interact with God in that place of your own relationship with him, and you say, you know what, Lord? I've heard it said of you that you're a faithful and kind God, and I need that now. I want to see that. I ask that you reveal it to me. I want to grow. I want to know you. And so this is where we come in prayer to building places of trust. It's finding that thing and saying, you know what? That thing I did many years ago that has just filled me with regret for so long and so much shame and guilt, I'm going to give this a go. I've never done this before, but I want to bring this out. Just say, can you speak something into this? I don't know what it needs to be. This is a mess in my life. I'm pretty good at patching it up and coping with it, and I want to bring this mess out. What do you say to this, Father? Help me to hear your voice. You know how I can hear or how I don't hear or how I feel I hear or not. Help me to understand. When I did that, whatever it is, or I'm so afraid of this happening in the future, or this is so precious to me, this thing in my life, if anything would happen to this, I don't know if I could continue living like this. is just everything to me. And I want you to speak into that. That is where the rubber hits the road. It's building the trust. And those conversations don't necessarily come up every day, but they will come up and they will need to come up in your lifetime. as we do that, we step out of our comfort zone. We say, Lord, I want to take steps of faith. And as you experience God interacting in those places, it has this snowball effect where you just hunger for more and more of that. You might get up one morning, you might not feel like what you want to do, but you say, I'm going to go for a walk in the rain or whatever it needs to be that day, just to work through that you do the will of your Father in heaven. I'm going to close here uh, with the words of this psalm in Psalm 116. And there's a brother uh, who was highlighting this to me recently. I thought, oh, it's, it's good. Oh, good. <laughs> the word of God is good. 
And I'll read just a few verses from uh, this psalm. You can read through it later on if you'd like. It says this in Psalm 116, verse 1 and 2. I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because He inclined His ear to me, therefore I will call on Him as long as I live. As long as I live. He is the one I will call upon. You can see how when you experience God in your relationship with Him, when you're interacting with Him in that way, your love for Him is going to grow. I can testify like this. I can, I can testify today to that. I love the Lord because He heard my plea for help this morning. I was thanking Him, Lord, thank You for Your ministry to me, just touching my heart. I don't even know what's going on within me, but You are doing something right now. The Lord today, brothers and sisters, heard my plea for mercy. He answered me today. What's that going to do tomorrow when I wake up and need His help? What's going to happen in my life? Call out. Call out. And the psalmist continues on and he gets down in verse 12 and he says this, What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits to me? This is what I will do. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. Because of what He has done to me, man, that's making me just want to do something. What can I do? How can I repay return? I can't, but wow. I just want to continue to call upon Him to see His salvation in my life over and over again, saving me from so many things and ultimately from hell into heaven. I will pay my vows. I will fulfill the beautiful things that are on my heart to serve Him and to minister to Him. Praise be to God. We have such a wonderful Father. What I'm going to do, I'm going to invite the band up. And um, before we sing this song, we're just going to wait for a little bit. And I want you just to turn to the Lord. You might be very used to praying or very fresh at it or haven't done it for some time. You might feel awkwardness. But I want you to turn to the Lord now. And pray through what He was touching and bringing up through this time of reflection. <coughs> Whatever you direction you need to pray, just pray that to the Lord now. It could be thanks, it could be confession, it could be asking Him for something. Just pray. And you might uh, sense the need to continue that prayer, uh, maybe with someone, even as we're singing or after the service, um, or you may need just a, uh, a room by yourself. You might need to just go home. You might need to go for a walk. You might need to just um, sit on your bed. You might need to journal. There may be someone you need to go to and talk about something that's happened. I simply just encourage you to continue to press along the path that the Spirit has just highlighted to you in this place. And Father, we just turn uh, our attention together to you again. Lord, we just thank you that you know us. I thank you that you know me. That you meet us exactly where we are at. You don't expect anything different. Indeed, you are saddened when we try and display something different from the reality of what's going on. 
to display something different to you. So, Lord, I just pray that um, by the work of your Spirit, that you would reveal yourself to us as we call out and know you will, Lord. That's your delight and your pleasure. But, Lord, may you lead us to call out, to pray to you, to share the heavy burdens or the delights, to be thankful, to be grateful to you, and to see, Lord, you answer, Lord, that we would know you more, that we would delight in you, that we would love you, that we would be quick to turn to prayer because there's someone who just knows us deeply and even though we can't hear you speak back to us audibly, how you do speak, how you do touch, how you do minister. And we thank you, Father, for how you've been doing this today. But Lord, may today not be enough for us. May tomorrow we hunger again, this afternoon, the next day, the next month, Lord. And this is only going to happen, Father, if we continue to come to you because you want a relationship with us, not something where we know something or where we feel something, but where we experience you, Lord. And we pray that this would come to pass for your glory and for our joy and peace. Amen.